Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our 325 participants tonight in this webinar. Um, you're joining us from all over the countryside. Some are joining the webinar, some the podcast, and it's great to see people on the chat line um, introducing themselves and see where you're coming from. This is a joint webinar tonight with um, Kids Matter, between Kids Matter and MHPN. And we welcome everybody from both those sectors and many other besides. Um, I just need to remind you that the case study was a couple of pages long, so I hope you did pick that up before logging in tonight and had, were able to read that. Uh, my name's Vicki Cowling. I'm facilitating tonight's webinar. I'm a social worker and psychologist and have worked for many years with children and young people and their families in quite a number of settings, currently in private practice. Um, my role is to facilitate tonight and first introduce our panel and um, then that will lead into the discussion that we hope, um, I suppose, generates more discussion. may not solve immediate problems but we hope it um, gives people ideas about collaborating. Um, now you would have seen the panellists' bios before tonight. And I'd like to start off by introducing Sally Letho. Sally's a primary welfare officer from Victoria. Sorry, Sarah. I beg your pardon, Sarah. Welcome, okay. Sarah. Thank what you. are some of the most... Um, yeah, you work in primary school, Sarah. Um, okay. What are some of the most satisfying changes that you've observed following the introduction of Kids Matter into your school, which has been quite a feature there? Um, well, How's I've it been, been beneficial? Or? Yeah, I've been at the school now for two years um, yeah. and we have had Kids Matter as long as I've been there, so for two years now and just the overall positive school community, um, having staff recognise mental health um, and how it affects children and how, how, how to best help the students and the families. Um, there's lots of ways I've felt that it's been really beneficial and I guess I've been touching on it a little bit through the slide um, by addressing all the four components of Kids Matter. So we'll get into that soon. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Thank you. I'd like to next welcome Michael Fasher. Michael's a GP and joins us in New South Wales. Uh, Michael, you've been involved in training medical students for many years and I just wonder what some of the changes you may have seen in medical training over the, over the decades you've been involved. Vicky, I think preparing people for general practice today has been revolutionised in areas where there have been good Medicare locals soon to transform into public health networks because they are the federally funded group that are working on promoting the kind of collaboration that we're celebrating tonight, stitching up service providers uh, in the community to provide more collaborative and efficient service to communities. Great. Thank you, Michael. Um, and Lynn is a psychologist and is in Melbourne. Thanks, Lynn, for joining us tonight. And you've worked in and, and with schools for over 20 years. And I wonder what some of the changes that you've noted um, across the education system over those, over those decades. Yeah, I think the last 20 years there's been a lot of changes in society as a whole and schools often um, as a microcosm of what's happening in society. So mm. some of the pressures that, that are in communities often come into schools and um, changes in families, um, cultural changes, um, <coughs> people from a range of, of cultural backgrounds. Um, all of that I think has come into schools and um, schools are then sort of adjusting to that. I, I think one of the biggest changes of course is technology and the role of technology in the lives yes. of all of us yes. in schools trying to keep up with children yeah. and people around that. Mm, absolutely. Thanks, Lynn. And finally, I'd like to welcome Sally Young, a social worker from Queensland. And Sally, you work in both public and private um, sectors. What are some of one or two key differences you would um, comment on in working in those different sectors? Between the private and the public yeah, sectors. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I think um, there are different advantages in different sectors, but uh, one of the um, wonderful advantages of working in the public sector is the, the possibilities of doing collaborative network work as part of the work. Um, of course in private practice it's um, 
um, it, it's, it's much more the relationship between the therapist and the, um, and the family coming along. But uh, for the sort of severe end of the spectrum, I, I feel multidisciplinary teams are, are, are a much more preferable way of, of assisting, um, assisting those families with severe difficulties. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sally, thanks. Um, now we have some ground rules there on the screen about um, how we communicate via the chat pages and uh, I have to get closer to see it, um, posting comments um, and so on. So I'll just leave you to have a look for that for a sec. Um, now if you find the chat box too distracting, you can minimise it by clicking on the down arrow at the top of the chat box. So you can, you're free to do that if you want. Now each panellist is going to give us a short um, discipline specific response to the case, um, followed by some a Q and A between um, the panel and the um, audience. And we have lots and lots of questions that many of you have submitted before tonight. So thank you for those. Uh, the learning outcomes tonight, uh, it's around collaboration obviously. Um, relating to the Harper family, developing an increased awareness of the benefits of collaboration, strategies to achieve effective and timely collaboration to support primary school children and their families, and developing an increased awareness of the benefits and opportunities for involvement with initiatives such as Kid Matters when working with primary school children. So our discussion tonight centres on the Harper family um, who have two children. Tina and John with um, Zoe and Tom and they're concerned that Zoe at 10 is placing too much pressure on herself to perform academically and is becoming increasingly worried about adult type issues and Tom who's seven is having issues with controlling his temper. And we'll start off with Sarah, a primary welfare officer and her slides relating to the Harper family. Thanks Vicky. Um, so just to briefly give you a little bit of background before I go into the slides. So as I said before, I'm working in the primary welfare officer role at the school, um, at Kingsley Park Primary School in Frankston, Victoria. Um, and we've had kids met at the school for two years now. So I'm just going to break it down into the four different components and how um, mm -hmm. kids met relates to the case study. So if, um, although Kids Matter Primary isn't specifically designed to help schools prevent and address anxiety, the four components do help schools address many of the risk factors related to anxiety and other mental health difficulties and they also help build the protective factors that prevent and reduce mental health difficulties. So firstly component one is based on building positive school community culture that provides security and safety for children. So this can take on many forms and often becomes the innate culture of the school that can be difficult to write about and talk about but becomes embedded within the primary school. Um, once you have been within the school you kind of get to understand the, um, the school perspective on mental health and wellbeing. Um, so in terms of how Fanback Primary School have supported Tom and Zoe, it seems as though they've got quite a good understanding in understanding Tom's behaviour in particular around his atypical and typical behaviour. They seem to have some kind of school wellbeing policies in place, not that they're mentioned, but um, there seems to be some good processes there around that. And there seems to be quite a good collaborative relationship between the teaching staff from year to year and between the parents um, and the teachers as well. So there's a few background factors there that look like they've set up quite a good positive school community so far. It would be good to kind of um, discuss that further, knowing a little bit more about the school. Um, so we'll just go into component two, this is the next slide. So component two is based on social and emotional learning or SEL. So um, SEL is looking at um, or emphasising children's learning and how to cope and feel better equipped to deal with challenges that might arise. So Kids Matter um, promotes social and emotional learning on their website with all the different evidence-based programs 
um, that a school can utilise in um, in addressing social and emotional learning. In the case study, it wasn't explicitly said what, which SEL program is used. Um, however, I'm sure it's there, given that it's been two years into the Kids Matter initiative, that so would have been good to find out a little bit more about that. Um, just as, as an example, at Kingsley Park Primary, we use the You Can Do It program, which looks at um, five keys, and they are resilience, organisation, getting along, confidence, and persistence. So those skills are practised within the classroom. Um, okay, so moving on to component three. So the third component is based on building strong relationships with the families, parents and carers. Together the school and family can help assist the child by developing their social and emotional learning and how to manage strong emotions. So some of the emphasis in this component is seen through the case study in that it seems as though there's been a good connection between the teachers um, and Tina, the mum, um, and also just their sharing of their concerns about Tom and Zoe, although I feel as they we need to more discussions would be need to be said about Zoe. Um, mm -hmm. the, the case study has also addressed the family relationship difficulties, um, particularly around Tina and John arguing about their working hours and who should be looking after the children. So I feel as though there needs to be quite a lot more information around what's happening for the family. There's also the grandparents who are playing quite a big caring role in looking after the children before and after school for some of the week. So it would be good to talk about that a little bit more. Um, and also just addressing the risk and protective family, uh, risk and protective factors that are present within the family and how that's impacting on the, the kids and, um, and the school as well. So that's what component three kind of addresses. So the next component is component four which is quite targeted in addressing children with mental health disabilities. So I feel as though the case study has utilised component four quite well. Um, it focuses quite a lot on um, the mental health interventions for Tom in particular. So um, for example, teachers were able to recognise some of Tom's underlying mental health difficulties at the time. Um, there seemed to be a school policy that was followed in terms of um, referring Tom, in terms of speaking to previous teachers and raising concerns with Tina as well. Um, from there, Tom's teacher referred him to the school counsellor for three sessions. Um, I would probably want to know a little bit more about who the school counsellor is. Is the school counsellor a psychologist or a chaplain or a social worker, I'd be a little be good to get more information about that. Um, the counsellor did address some anxiety concerns, but it appears um, that there were some time constraints. So then the school counsellor had to refer externally. Um, from there, Tom was seen by a GP due to some physical complaints, which led to a discussion around some of those psychological concerns that were happening for Tom. And from there, the GP looked at a possible referral to CAN and then some one-to-one -one work with um, an ATAP psychologist. Um, lastly, the case study discusses that a student support group type meeting would be set up at the end in terms of linking it all together and where to go next. So it mm -hmm. looks like the school has done really well in linking the family and the students um, in terms of the component for capacity. So just checking on time, do I have a little bit more time? about half a minute. <laughs> okay, so just the next slide is just some further comments. I mean, there's, there's so much I could talk about, but just briefly. Sure, yeah. Um, it looks as though Fern, Fernback Primary have utilised all the four components quite well, particularly around component four, as I said, and probably component three. It would be good to talk a little bit more around what the teachers themselves can be doing for Tom and Zoe in the classroom. Um, I've just touched on a little bit of on the Kids Matter BETLS approach, mm -hmm. um, which is a useful tool on their website around how to address Tom and Zoe's behaviour. Um, in terms of the CAMS referral, we probably wouldn't go that um, go down that path at this stage due to just the 
lack of severity, I'd say, um, but probably yeah. would utilise some other support such as on site or the Oz Child Shyness, Shyness Program or the Triple SOs in terms of some work um, at the school um, and some possible family services and looking a little bit more around risk and protective factors for Zoe and Tom. So there's lots to discuss, but um, that's just a little Certainly. bit of a snapshot of what it looks yeah. like from um, a primary welfare officer perspective. It so illustrated well the um, relationship between Kids Matter program and that particular family too. So thanks yeah. very much, Thank Sarah. You. Yeah. Um, Michael, would you like to proceed now and um, with your reflections from a GP's point of view? Thanks, Vicky, and thanks for that, Sarah. I learned a lot. I read the Harper story and it triggered some thoughts that I hope uh, will provoke and promote some discussion. Feelings of anxiety are universal, and one of the challenges of childhood is learning to recognise and name strong feelings such as anxiety. Seems to me that's the first step to understanding them, managing them, and living with them. And this process can be retarded if adults discount children's feelings, as in the, we've all heard people say, "What's he got to be anxious about?" Yeah. And only a kid. Others may collude in their child's avoidant behaviour and therefore promote anxiety. And of course, living anxiously is very often modelled by anxious parents. Professor Tim Usherwood is Professor of General Practice at Westmead and I like his tip which I think is relevant to our talk tonight, our discussion tonight. Now in most consultations, particularly in general practice, it's important that the psychosocial inquiry proceeds in parallel with the biological inquiry. The value of this tip was powerfully illustrated to me by another child who was sent home from Fernbach Primary School. She came to see me, seven years old, a pupil who had frightened a teacher by complaining of the room swaying and having difficulty seeing. But really, after careful listening and thorough examination, it became clear that this presentation, at first sight, of biological disease, was in fact the effect of anxiety triggered adrenaline. And as uh, I was pleased that I got that one right, but ruefully reflected on the fact that I had missed the psychosocial inquiry when Tom Harper, Tom Harper, had previously uh, presented with bellyache. Of course, there was plenty to be elicited back then. Mm. In the absence of accessible local pathways to quality care, it's easier for doctors to medicalise psychosocial distress. What we've heard about Kids Matter at Fernbach is really an excellent example of how improving health literacy in the community increases the capacity of the community to support parents and children managing strong emotions and other similar issues. To the Harpers, some preliminary thoughts. The fact that Tom did well at school last year is encouraging and pointed, I thought, to strengths in the way his family had been functioning and that would be something I'd want to celebrate with them. The fact that Tina and John recognise that their arguments have had an impact on Tom is another strength that I'd want to draw attention to and celebrate. The fact that there are ongoing arguments suggests an area to be worked on. I thought it was good that Tom did so well at school last year. That made developmental disorders unlikely. Though the fact that the often plays alone made me think. And whilst there are multiple red flags in the case study for anxiety being a problem for both children and possibly their father, I need to keep in mind that Tom's behaviours may reflect that he's having difficulty coping with increased academic demands of moving up to year one. And so wrapping up, before I rushed to intervention stroke therapy with this family and family members, I'd be really keen to be clear about where each of them were as individuals and as a group on the cycle for change. Are these folk pre-contemplators 
or are they ready for action? Because if they're not ready for action, I'm going to proceed slowly. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you, Michael. Um, Lynn, you're talking from the psychology perspective about the Harper family. Yeah, thanks, Vicky. I thought a few sort of initial thoughts as I was looking through the case study. I, I felt quite hopeful um, reading mm -hmm. through and, and seeing that while, while there's some challenges and there's some work to, work to do and people have identified that, I also think this is a, a time for opportunity and the school's awareness and responsiveness, which is um, due to Kids Matter and the work that's been happening there for two years, it hasn't just happened like that and it doesn't always work, but the work of Kids Matter I think has, has really shown the capacity of schools and families to, to work together and identify concerns at a pretty early stage and the parents have been willing to hear that. Um, the family's not at crisis point, so that gives us a few more options. It means, like Michael just suggested, we can go a little bit slowly, check things out. We don't need to rush to um, a crisis response at this point. And I think the children are young enough for effective intervention for the family to grow and develop at, at this stage um, and strengthen the family unit. So I think it's really hopeful, you know, in terms of the timing of this, that we're not waiting until they're adolescents and then it's much harder to encourage um, young people to, to seek help. I think another question that often uh, is useful is, is a question around why now? And this is trying to tease out what might be a complex web. And we could be saying, well, the why, why now is really to do with the, the um, change that's happened with Tina returning to work. Um, but I think there's more to it than that. And I think it would be tempting just to say, well, you know, it's an adjustment period, we'll just let them go. But when you actually look at what's going on underneath, the level of conflict and tension that's been there for a while, um, some things that are happening at school, for both Tom and Zoe, and Zoe, of course, has been sort of um, left out a little bit because Tom's the one that, that's showing the externalising behaviours which, which we kind of tend to notice so Tom's sort of been targeted a little yeah. bit but there's things going on for Zoe as well. Um, there's previous concerns when you dig a little bit um, beyond the current situation. We know that Tom experienced difficulties separating during his early schooling so there's a bit of a history of this and developmentally there might be some things that are happening as well and Michael suggested around you know, the learning challenges that, that might be going on for Tom. Um, and, and Zoe as well, which is getting older, becoming more aware of what's happening in the world. So there's lots going on in this family, even though it might present as, you know, there's some time as the time of change. Um, anxiety within the family and looking at who should we focus on is another um, important point, I think. And we, um, again, Michael has talked about the, the patterns of behaviour with, with families and anxious um, families um, and anxious children, but do we focus on Tom, which is kind of where the, where the story's gone so far, that Tom's been targeted for the intervention, but clearly the family is also experiencing some, some challenges. So I think looking at um, the child within the context of family is really important. And we know that if we want to support children, we, we can really do a lot to support them by supporting the adults in their lives and parents are, are you know, primary people. So looking at what's going on in terms of their um, family anxiety and tension, communication style, what, what's actually happening with them. I think it's also really important to remember that parents um, can find it very challenging when a school talks to them about concerns with, with their child. So it's, it's quite hard sometimes to hear that when you, you're doing your best and, and you might be seeing some concerns and then when people talk to you about those that they're noticing them at school and your children are not happy and, and struggling with things, it, it can really damage confidence. So I think that um, being aware of that, building their self-efficacy promoting their resilience which will then flow on um, to the children as well. Looking at the strengths which is what Michael talked about as well, what's worked before, what you know, things that they're doing well, um, I think those messages are really important and that again that hopefulness coming through is crucial. Uh, social support again not being alone with struggles so parents are sort of getting a sense that this is something that a lot of parents and families struggle with, anxiety is, is not an unusual thing, family changes, family dynamics and pressures on families is very common. Um, so lots of families go through this. So it can really help for, for families to hear that from, from others who are going through similar, similar things. Um, enhancing parenting skills is, is um, obviously how do we deal with these sort of situations is really important as part of that family communication pattern and getting some information about anxiety. So it's clear that there's some anxiety happening, whether there's other things as well, um, we need to check that out. But certainly the anxious um, signs that we're seeing, getting some more information about that can be helpful and kids matter has that information. Other adults in the lives of this family, grandparents are having a really important um, role to play here. So they've um, got a caring role at the moment. So that might be a change in the grandparent role, it might be spending more time with them, we don't know. They might have always played a very active role. So some support for them is probably really important. The kids get into school and at the end of the school day, that can be really challenging. So the, parent, the grandparents are bearing the brunt of that, it seems, at the moment. So including them 
and getting their, their perspective because they've, they've been through parenting, they've also got some insights probably that we could really use. So I think that would be a really useful thing to do. And then the classroom teachers and school staff, and this is something Sarah talked about as part of that work of Kids Matter, that the school is really aware of and really wanting to be responsive and supportive. So they're dealing with Tom and Zoe in the classrooms um, throughout the school day um, and having to respond to issues like attendance or, or issues that are happening for them. Um, and that the teachers are often quite anxious themselves and wanting to do what's best for, for children and for the family, not make things worse. So they'll really be looking for some support as well and may well be feeling quite anxious. If you've got anxious children in your classroom amongst all of the children in your classroom, it can be fine. Yeah. Um, you know, it can trigger your own anxiety. Um, and Kids Matter provides some tools like the Bettles one that, um, that Sarah mentioned as well that they can use. Collaboration and effective communication is really important. So we've already seen that, that's already started. But if we're going to be looking at some extra external mental health supports being arranged, um, it's very important that we, we have this sort of this idea around collaborating together, working towards the same sorts of goals, being clear about roles, being clear about what communication is happening, what information can be shared and what information is, um, is you know, kept private, um, developing some short term plans around the, the main priorities that, that are there for, for each sort of party and, and hearing the voice of children in this I think is really important and maintaining the regular contact between home and school so that people are on the same same path, the children are getting similar messages, um, that the people are really working together. Um, meetings I think are really important and we've seen that that's starting to be to be set up as part of that process and, and I think the school psychologist or counsellor can be a really good linchpin for that work, can really be a person to pull that together, can kind of have that, that sit between health, education and family to really bring people together. And I guess lastly, again, returning to that hopeful notion, um, there's lots of interventions that we know have a good evidence base around working with children around anxiety, and there's more and more that are emerging along the way. So we've, we've got a whole range of um, different approaches that we can take. Some of them can be in a therapy situation with, with um, the children, possibly with parents, the universal social emotional skill development that, that Sarah talked about that would be happening in a kids matter school can, it can be really helpful as part of this overall um, uh, universal sort of and targeted approaches that can happen to be comprehensive. Parenting skills training might be useful. Um, parents and teachers, adult resilience programs can also um, play a role in here. And, and now increasingly we're looking at online programs that are being explored and, and being evaluated. And there's one in particular that's, that's being looked at at the moment. And mindfulness as well is another um, kind of um, tool that's, that's becoming a bit mainstream that might be really useful. So I, I guess you know, finishing off just in that hopeful notion again, we know that there's good evidence behind these these kinds of approaches, and so again to have trust and faith that we can we can be working together to really provide support to to the family. Many thanks for that, Lynn. And finally, we have Sally um, presenting her perspective as a social worker. Thanks, Sally. Oh, thanks, Vicky. Um, look, I'll, I'll um, I agree with uh, what. Uh, my fellow panellists have said, so I'll try not to repeat um, what, what people yeah. have said, but uh, just taking the eyes out of what, what I've, I've written. Um, the importance of um, taking a developmental history um, and, mm -hmm. and getting good cross-sectional information to obtain a sense of the depth, pervasiveness and suffering that the anxiety causes Tom. But uh, uh, particularly in the assessment phase, I think it's important to keep as open a mind as possible as to what's happening. And certainly in the information gathering, one also gains a sense of the, the dynamics of, um, of how different parts of um, uh, the, the, the family system or, or professional system may relate to each other. Uh, with, the, with an anxious boy, the, the um, importance of seeing both the, the parents and potentially the grandparents um, without Tom, so that there's a clear space to um, um, both take a history but get a sense of um, um, how Tom is seen within his family um, family unit and, uh, and what the different perspectives are. Um, also the importance of seeing Tom um, on his own in an age appropriate way to get a sense of how he thinks and feels and as Lynn mentioned the use of play with a, a child this age, you know, listening for his anxieties, there's a, a reference to sort of nightmares about dreams, somatic worries, school, friendship uh -huh. and, and separation anxiety. There's a hint that separations are, are, um, are, are 
may be painful in, 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 for this family. In terms of thinking about the family, I guess one's trying to get a sense of, is this an anxious or overwhelmed family? And is this a sort of a more recent thing? There's a suggestion about the mother's return to work, or is this more, more a, a longitudinal thing over time? And uh, uh, important to get a sense of that in terms of understanding the effects on Tom. But there is this question, as Zoe is symptomatic, as to whether it might be useful to see the whole family. I think, again, in a sort of open-hearted way, to hear how the family manages stresses and changes and transitions. Um, I, I, I was thinking that the meaning of um, you know, separation, there's a, a bit of a reference to separation anxiety, change and developmental transitions, what they mm -hmm. mean in in this mm. family. Um, the, um, also listening out for the sibling relationship. There's a reference in the case study of Tom pushing his sister. And I, I, I just wondered without any sort of clear um, conviction about it, but whether there were sort of um, perhaps sort of quite set roles in the family. Are boys the externalizers and girls the internalizers? Are, always seen as naughty and a girl's good and internalizing and have anxieties in a different way. So, so sort of listening out for um, what, what, are, what are the roles um, that the characters have within the family and do, do, do these roles enhance um, secure attachments or, um, yeah. or, or create rivalry? Also, that just that last thought about is there a parallel between there's a reference to the parents having different opinions and arguing, and also the fighting between the siblings. So you know, sometimes there is a sort of echo in what's happening in the in the sibling group as to what what's happening happening for the parents. In terms of um, referrals. Um, I uh, wrote about sort of risks and challenges, you know, that it, it sounds like there's a clear case for Tom to be referred, that the um, school counsellor has a sort of um, limited time capacity, but just the, the whole delicacy of referrals, of how is the referral seen, um, uh, you know, the more agencies involved, the, the, the more one has to be aware of different professional language and there may be different goals or views on what would be useful. So important, important to keep this sort of collaborative um, um, task in the mind of um, anyone seeing Tom. Yeah. Uh, but um, any referral acts as a bridge to another service which may or may not succeed. Um, that that um, you know, it, it, important to listen for uh, in in the suggestion of a referral of how is this referral seen? Is it is there an anxiety about the mental health um, referral, which actually may complicate it being a, a successful referral unless that sort of works through a bit? Mm -hmm. Just the, the the advantages, um, perhaps uh, saying what. Um, what's well, sort of known, but just the, the advantages of the ATAP system is that it has this wonderful level of accessibility, but it doesn't um, completely support the practitioner to do family therapy or family work if needed. So, so it's, um, it's something to sort of keep in mind in terms of what might be the needs. If, if it emerges that it's more a, a family-based um, anxiety and is there a family agency um, that, that may, be, may be more appropriate. Um, in terms of uh, you know, thinking of collaboration, our you know, sort of overall theme of tonight's discuss discussion, I found this quote which I was quite fond of, that collaboration is never easy, which is why it's more talked about than practiced. It mm. requires a great deal of work. But I, I sort of feel collaboration's a bit like motherhood. No one's against it, but it's it's, it's, it's a much harder job than it sounds. Certainly, yeah. and that uh, and that it takes work, and it um, it, it takes um, everyone ha keeping an open mind to what um, uh, what each of us um, have to contribute. The, the dangers of professional rivalries and defensiveness and anxieties. And, and misperceptions about um, about what what different professions may may do, and and I think just as often as as these sort of 
um, emotional um, anxieties that might be in the air in collaboration. Often just the lack of time compromises um, how, how much mm. we're, we're able to do this successfully. The, also the issue of consent for information is important to work out and that in itself takes quite a, a bit of time. And working out what needs to be shared and what needs to be private. I, I, I prefer in working with families and if I was working with Tom, of the, I prefer this idea of private, uh, using the word privacy rather than confidentiality because I think it captures something of what's emotionally needed. There are some areas that he may need privacy about, um, but one might need to negotiate um, uh, around the, um, what are the areas that his parents may need to know that he worries about, and equally um, what areas, again, the, the school may need to know if there's significant, um, significant worries that um, are, are there for him at school. So all of that takes quite a bit of of negotiating. Um, and, and just uh, just some uh, fur further so uh, thoughts, just thinking Sally, about... Sally, it's Vicky. Could I just ask you to just summarise this last slide because okay. we're starting okay. to run out of time. Uh, yeah, okay, thanks. yes, yes. Um, oh, perhaps just to keep in mind that, that mm -hmm. the um, family system and the professional network may actually end up a, as complex as each other. Yes. And, and, and yeah. so, so for people to stay aware of that, you know, the, to, to, to try and resist sort of um, fr a fragmentation in, in, in the work. And, I, and that the more, I, I guess this second point is perhaps the point I want to emphasise is the more anxiety yes. about a fa there is about the family, the more vulnerable the system is to splitting. And that the importance mm. that Tom and his family remain at the centre of any intervention. I'm sure everyone knows that, but I just think it's always worth Doesn't saying that. Doesn't hurt to say it again, yeah. But also it emphasises the importance of people having supervision as well. Yes, yes. To help, to help with that. Yes, yes yeah. Yes. Look, thank you all four of you for those um, complimentary presentations um, highlighting the issues from a systems and a family and a school perspective. Um, we now move on to some questions and discussion. Um, our panel members have put in some questions as well and I'm wondering if uh, any one of you, Sarah or Sally or Lynn, would like to pose your question to um, to one another. I'm, I'm happy uh, to pose. Okay, one. thank you. Sorry, yeah. Um, Thanks, I'm, I've mentioned already a couple of times technology and the role of technology that's coming into play and I mentioned the BRAVE program as, as one of those programs but I'm I'm just curious and interested in, in how people are feeling about that and, and the role that online support, online programs, um, perhaps families, children accessing and schools accessing online programs when they might have traditionally um, sort of referral and what the benefits might be but also what some of the cautions or risks might be. And how might it have a role in working in a collaborative fashion as well? Mm, yes. Mm. So um, Sally, Michael, Sarah, any one of you have a comment about that? Yeah. I. I mean, very briefly, I'm not sure about the cautions, but I did have a family in with a very young child with anxiety this week who has a teenager who refuses uh, to come for treatment, so he's well and truly a pre-contemplator. And I wondered, particularly for an adolescent, that if an online anxiety program might be ideal. Mm hmm Yep. Any other comments about that? Oh, it's Sally here. D just uh, to add to that, uh, I think um, I think probably I imagine we'd all agree we wouldn't want it as instead of um, um, the possibility of um, of in-person contact, particularly with Tom. I, I wouldn't have. I'd certainly not rush to sort of an, any sort of online intervention given his age and vulnerabilities. But I think um, just thinking of Zoe, if um, I, I think sometimes when there's more shame involved regarding a difficulty, it sometimes helps. The on, online interventions can help form a bridge to um, helping people, young people, feel some courage for seeking help from there. But um, it, and um, 
And I think that some of the Kids Helpline research also supports that uh, um, young people who feel a lot of shame about their difficulties often prefer the um, but more the sort of using um, using their online counselling than um, than on the phone counselling. So I think that's an interesting thing to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Um, can I jump in? Yes, certainly. Uh, I haven't had any experience personally with children accessing online programs as yet, but the first thing that came to mind was um, outside the case studies, children on the spectrum, on the autism spectrum, mm -hmm. given their high interest in using computers and um, technology. And I guess that, um, that their inability to interact socially at times, it can kind of take that away and it might be just a little bit more accessible for them. At the same time, we don't want to limit their social interactions um, and, and therapeutic interventions, but it could be just another perspective to use for children on the spectrum given their interest um, and, yeah, just kind of take down the walls that might, um, yeah, limit, limit their use around that. So it's, just another perspective, but I am interested in reading a little bit more about the Brave program and if anyone has used it and um, and I guess how it's worked for the kids that have used it. But I'm not aware of anyone in our schools that have used it at this stage. But definitely, or maybe one of our about. maybe one of our participants has, and they can um, type in, type into yeah. the general chat. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. just say that. In the, I mean, I think that was a very interesting uh, part of the discussion. It's really important for me here that we don't focus on Tom. I think that some people might have the notion you can take Tom out of this family, fix him up and then put him back in it. And uh, I think that doesn't uh, appreciate the shades of grey. Yes, well, I think probably um, a lot of this would have a family focused approach and each individual in the family and their particular needs, including the grandparents. Yeah. Um, Sally, you had a, a statement or a question um, which actually relates to a couple of questions that participants submitted as well. Um, would you just like to read that out? Have you got it in front of you? Or? Yes. yes, thanks Vicky. Uh, it's just a sort of clinical uh, dilemma um, and, and it is after the referral has been made to the ATAPS worker, Tom's father rings both the GP and the school to say he's up, upset he hasn't been informed that this was happening. He speaks at length that the family is falling apart, apart with both children being more anxious since, since their mother returned to work. He says the children need a mother, not a mental health worker. Any thoughts on how to respond? And I suppose in the framework of collaboration, that's also remembering that we are collaborating with parents as well. So they're part of the collaborative picture. Yeah. Uh -huh. So would other I, panelists like to comment on that? Yeah, I think this father, if he has been left out, has every reason to be upset about that. And it goes yes. back a bit to my concluding point about being sure where everybody in this family is on the spectrum from pre-contemplation to deciding to act and it's I mean with this sort of family this sort of stuff is usually easy to sort out once the family courts involved and we've got separated families then it becomes a nightmare but my approach to Tom as Sally has posed to Tom's father would be to invite him in to agree with him that things shouldn't have got this far without him and see him and his wife together to discuss the issues Yes. Do you want me to? Sally, Lynn, Sarah? Yep. Sarah? Yeah, sure. Yeah. If you um, want to come in, yeah. Yeah. So I think um, I'd be concerned that Tom's father hadn't been aware of any of, of everything that happened so far, but I think in at the end of the case study where the emphasis was on bringing a meeting together, um, that would be a timely time for Tom's time father to come in and um, talk about what's going on for him and why he hasn't been involved, what his goals are for the, for the kids. Um, and 
and discuss a little bit more around his comment about mum not being a mental health worker. Like, what is it that's going on for the family? So I think having all the parties come to a meeting would be really useful. It is difficult to get all the parties to collaborate um, due to time constraints and things like that at the one meeting, but I think that would definitely solve a lot of Tom's father's difficulties around that. So I think that would be, I know at, at the primary school level, that's what I would be doing. Um, and I find the most success when we have our student support meetings and have all the parties there, um, put all the discussion on the table and have an action plan as a result of um, the concerns raised. Okay, thanks Sarah. Um, well perhaps we'll move back to some of the questions that um, that participants have submitted over the last few days or whenever. And one of them is it's coming back to the core primary task I suppose for tonight, addressing the issue of collaboration. And what somebody has asked, what are the barriers that the panel see as um, existing in, in blocking a collaboration? What specific barriers? would you identify just one or two perhaps from each person? It's a big question. But, um, I'm, I'm happy like to, to, to start Thank with you. a couple. Yes. I think one of the biggest barriers that um, wasn't present in this particular scenario is getting the family on, on board. So people might raise a concern with, um, with the family, so people in the school might raise a concern and parents might might not be ready to hear that. So it's a bit like what Michael was saying about contemplation. So really they're, whether they're recognising some concerns, whether they're open to hearing that, and without that um, support, it's really very difficult. So that, that's a barrier before you can even start to look at look at referrals. And sometimes that, that's very real. Absolutely, yeah. I'm just, Lena, I'm just looking at some um, statements that some participants have put in. Um, how do you approach parents without offending them is one mm -hmm. statement. Another one is if parents um, don't want to collaborate to support their child, they're in yeah. denial is the word used. Yeah. So yeah. it's very difficult to get things started yeah. um, and how, do, how does one manage that? Mm -hmm. So others have comments about um, barriers to collaboration? Well, I think um, the, the two things I'd say, one is Collaboration, collaboration takes a lot of time that, uh, that we mm. often haven't quite set aside enough time and, and I think often systems um, uh, have a, a risk of being driven to solve a problem without working through a problem and, and we might describe that in our patients but it's also in our systems that we have to go slowly to, to, to work, work through what's going to be the best um, outcome for Tom and his family. And, and I, I think systems often need to sort of slow down to work, work it through properly. Yeah, look, I totally agree. Go ahead, Michael. So, uh, look, I agree with that. I think that but it just comes back to motivational counselling and the cycle of change. I mean, if, if you can't invite parents to share with you that they perceive a problem, then what you have to do is keep on holding them and keep the relationship going and do what you can to move them on from pre-contemplation. But there is certainly no point in uh, darting ahead of achieving the, uh, the mother, the parent, the family being with you and being ready to act. Lynn, would you like to comment on that one? Oh, you've done that, <laughs> sorry. Um, Sarah. Yeah, yeah, well this is something we, is that's very relevant in our schools. Teachers are often saying to me that they're concerned yeah. about um, the kids, how do they go about it, and what we find is um, I guess I kind of call it planting the seed, it's, um, kind mm. of raising it if, if there's concerns early on in prep but um, the teachers can see that the parents aren't really receptive to in um, taking those concerns in that over time perhaps towards the middle primary school years, um, unless you know things become quite severe, um, it would be addressed earlier but just kind of building those relationships and that's where Kids Matter really comes into it. Um, building those relationships and support through the school early on um, can eventually help bridge that gap and hopefully the parents come on board a little bit later. That's 
But unless, like um, Michael said, unless we're ready, unless the parents are ready to come on board, then um, we can only support the kids as best as we can at the school level. Yes. Do you think having Kids Matter in the school creates over time a certain culture and therefore makes these kind of supports more more more, um, more presentable or more um, uh, acceptable to families? Yeah, I think so. I've, mm. I feel the school that I've been in has had a culture shift towards mental health and wellbeing, um, particularly for teachers. It's, it's getting there more slowly for parents, but um, just having the material um, on the website through the school, through the newsletters, um, discussions around mental health, um, there's little bits that are happening everywhere that are throughout the school that I think is helping yeah, bridge the gap and that stigma around mental health disabilities and making it more acceptable to understand mm. um, yeah, the mental health presentation of our kids. So I think so. I, we've, I think our schools have still got a long way to go, but I feel Kids Matter really helps bridge that gap. But I guess if you're seeking you know, cultural change, it does happen all over quite a long period of time, as Sally that's kind right. of alluded to. Yeah. Yeah. Just and that's why Kids has to be, Matter is supposed. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I was just going to say there has to be some patience here with this. Yeah, and that's why Kids process. Matter is yeah. supposed to be done in a year. It's it's not a program. It's the overarching mm. initiative. Um, that we're into our we're into component three now at Kingsley Park, um, and I don't think we will be finished Kids Matter until the following year. So that's four years of rolling it out, um, and then after that we will go back to component one to ensure that we're um, that everything is maintained. So it it is a slow change, but it needs to happen um, for when everyone is ready to get on board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, another question or statement was um, collaboration initiatives um, bring challenges about integration, integrating different values of teams and people. Um, so I suppose just your observations about, and it's fairly complex to ask, I guess, but it's you know it's sort of central to being able to collaborate from a systems perspective. How do we accommodate different approaches that different groups have or different sectors have, and different their different goals? How do we? What kind of um, mindsets can we each have to um, accommodate these differences? Maybe Lynn, could I ask yeah. you to start? Sure. I, I think language is one of the, the biggest um, mm. challenges because sometimes the value systems or the approach and the interest is quite similar. Uh, people are working towards the same thing but might not exactly, realise yeah. that's what they're yes. doing. So I think yeah. it's terrifying taking some time, build a relationship, build trust, check out language, listen, share ideas and, and try and check out what is it that we're, we're sort of saying and we're actually saying the same thing even though it's coming across in, in some different ways. So I think that can overcome a lot of lot of problems. But it, it takes time, mm. which, which is one of the Again, challenges. time. And there's so much pressure to reach targets nowadays, I think. Yeah. yeah. And Sally, do you have observations about that? Um, yes, I, I think it, there's sort of language and I think there's also anxiety that, uh, that, um, uh, that gets in the way of professional sharing, um, that, uh, there's always the confidentiality thing that needs to be worked out which is um, mm. right and proper. But um, I think we can sometimes hide behind confidentiality um, as a way of protecting ourselves um, from um, fully engaging with our, you know, our colleagues whether it's Teachers, or you know, other other mental health professionals, or the GP, we can we can hide behind um, confidentiality as a defensive practice, um, uh, uh, which which may not be in the best interests of, of the family or the young person. Yes. But, that, but yes. I don't want to minimise confidentiality. It's still a very important um, thing. To no. Think about a number of a number of participants did raise that. Um, you know, how do you? How do you exchange information? You know, is it possible to exchange information if you don't have consent from parents? Um, but maybe we'll come back to that. Um, Michael, do you have um, observations about the, um, I guess, the challenges of different approaches and goals and how we may overcome them? I think that uh, 
the mental health professionals network has uh, I, inaugurated a meeting in a disadvantaged uh, little suburb close to me here and that has produced a lot of uh, respectful collaborative interaction in which people have felt mutually valued and been delighted it's been a uh, in fact one whole professional group like uh, early childhood nurses have actually stated that they felt valued for the first time so getting people together having the opportunity on a regular basis to have that uh, yeah. discussion which generates respect meeting outside the the case conference sort of idea yeah yeah mm -hmm. and Sarah do you have any further comments about the different challenges of competing or differing goals and approaches yeah well that you've experienced? I, it, yeah? Yeah, it's similar to what everyone has said already. Um, yeah. Definitely getting everyone together in a in a meeting format to put all of their ideas on the table, but documenting it as well, putting it all in one, we might call it a behaviour support plan or something like that, where all the goals are shared and they're explicit and consistency between the teacher, the parent and all the other professionals involved is um, is crucial for any gains to be made for the child. Um, I mean, I've got. I'm just thinking of one student um, who um, their team of people working with him. Um, we send a group email every week on how he's going at school and how the therapies are going outside of school with the consent of that parent. And there's been so much communication around that, and it's just benefited him. In, in he's had such a good year so that's just one example where communication has worked really well and that's the collaboration between the professionals but that was set from the beginning of his intervention so it was quite clear that that communication was going to occur and um, yeah so that's one example from my school anyway well that's a great way to use email and internet yes yeah Perfect. yeah yeah well, in a way, that leads on to another question here. Um, somebody has asked, how do you, you know, strategies are discussed with the parents and the child in the school setting, or sorry, the psychologist or the private practitioner or the practitioner outside the school, but what, how can they be translated into the school setting so that the work, the ongoing work at the school can be followed through? Um, what what do you see as difficulties about achieving that? Maybe I could start with you, Sally. Um, I mean, it it is it is the challenge. I, I, what I find a useful sort of just a, a way of thinking, um, like if I was seeing Tom and I was um, going to see his parents for a, um, a a review session, I might say something to Tom like. Um, your words in here are private, but are, are there any other things um, that we think mm -hmm. about that you'd like me to talk to your parents about? Or would you be happy for me to talk about the themes of, of, of what we talk about? And, uh, and, and usually children are agreeable to that sort of negotiated confidentiality. And I, I wonder if... Um, that same sort of theme can be with the family and the school. I think it's very important people's uh, words are kept private so we're not repeating what people say because that yes, it just yeah. becomes a, a form of professional gossip really uh, you know, that, 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 that we translate it with their mm. permission in, in, into, in, into, um, into a formulation um, that might be useful to the school um, in, in thinking about how to manage Tom or how to manage Zoe. And I think if, if, if we can do it in that way, if there's a disagreement, the disagreement is between the professionals, not, not a disagreement with the a, a mm -hmm. criticism of the parents because they said such and such. You know, that uh, if, we, if we can sort of bear that, I, I think um, it, it, the, the, um, we, the collaborative work can be an important breach to, to sort of keep all parties to get as, together as much as possible. Yeah, maybe what the question was also asking was, you know, the person has perhaps done the work with the child and the family here. How is that 
and I guess you have answered it to some degree, how is that then translated back into the school and into the classroom? So maybe I could ask someone else to think about that. Um, Sarah, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I guess from from what I'm hearing from the teachers in my schools is the key for them is what are the strategies? We don't, they don't, they understand the confidentiality of what the child has been saying to the private practitioner, but it's about what strategies will work for them in the classroom. So keeping it really simple. Um, I see, yeah. Yeah, so making it um, applicable, like if, if they're feeling anxious, what, what can they do in that moment or what can they do in those early signs of feeling anxious? Um, they're the key things that the teachers want to know about and, and have it documented so um, other staff are aware of how to assist as well. Um, mm -hmm. in case they're not there for the day, but they're, the, they're those little things that are just so crucial um, to preventing things like anxiety in the classroom or if they are feeling anxious and they know what to do. Okay, and Liz, uh, do you uh, have anything? Oh, sorry, Michael, go on. Look, I, I agree with that, and I think that things can often be very simple and easily overlooked, and in our case study, one of the things that Tom wanted to know was who was going to look after him after school. Mm. Uh, and the fact that that moment passed without that being firmly and clearly addressed uh, was a miss. And uh, so that was a simple strategy for managing a seven-year-old's anxiety <laughs> that on this occasion was missed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Lynn, do you have anything further about this one? I guess one thing that's not sort of to do with the case study, but what comes to mind is a, an initiative that started in Victoria called Cassia, which is um, Royal Children's Hospital and schools working together in, in parts of Victoria and, and some other models yeah. around the country. And this was really looking at um, mental health practitioners work, coming into schools, doing some work with the, all the staff. So it was a sort of early intervention model, working with some children and, and families that was targeted, but then also working with the school as a whole. So around particular issues, mental health difficulties. So it was really bringing staff along and having them in the school. So I think that kind of approach, it's a bit like the Kids Matter model really, where you're sort of doing that kind of universal work. So you're prepping, if you like, and having the staff mm. so then when they, they have a particular child and family, they've got some background and they've got something to contextualise that in. So I think that kind of approach is really important in this. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And that, Can I just sorry. jump in quickly, sorry? Of course, of course. Just to let you know that we did do CASIA, um, the CASIA program that Lynn just mentioned at Kingsley Park this year twice. So we um, did it with a group of year two and three students and then a group of preps and one students. So I was quite heavily involved in that and it's very thorough. The whole parent's background presentation is taken in um, very thoroughly and what's been really use useful for us is um, in is assisting the parents in particular in um, how to help their kids and then the strategies for the teachers in the classroom and also if there were further concerns for, from those kids and they were able to be referred into ELMS which is our version of CAMS so we found that really useful so thanks Lynn for bringing that up I forgot to mention that. Uh, that kind of is associated too with some um, other questions relating to schools particularly. Um, I suppose how can, I'll just read out a couple of them. Yeah. What can be implemented in schools to encourage and increase children's well-being? Meaning you know what early prevention and early intervention I guess Kids Matter contributes to that. Um, and what can pe people are curious about how they can help break down misunderstandings about mental health problems in school settings and how can we support children in the, so that they're not subject to sort of um, negative comments. So perhaps if we start with a question about, um, yes, acknowledging kid ma kids matter, kids matters, but um, what can we do in schools? How can we support schools to be more, um, I suppose, more receptive to supporting children and families where certainly where children have some sort of behavioural or emotional problems. Maybe Lynn, could you kick that off? I think um, Kids Matter is the obvious one that jumps out. Yeah. So maybe thinking about what, what Kids Matter does. And, and I think one of the things that happens with schools is that there's lots of different 
language again. I keep talking about language, but schools talk about well-being, they talk about resilience, they talk about mental health. Often they're not wanting to talk about mental health because they're concerned about the stigma as well. So part of what Kids Matter does in that approach is, is really trying to break that down and trying to bring all of that together if schools are already doing particular programs or, or doing initiatives that might be anti-bullying focused or resilience focused, bringing that together so you're actually understanding it from that mental health lens and understanding well-being in a holistic way using language that speaks to that community. So I think understanding that well-being is, is sort of connected to all of these these other things and, and making sense, sense of that and, and not going off on a whole range of different initiatives because I think that can be tempting that you go off and mm, do one thing for yeah. a while and then you, you look for something else. So I think that's what Kids Matter as a framework, bringing all of those things in together and you keep it alive, you keep it fresh and you can you can do new things is part of it but you've got an overarching kind of lens that you're looking through and, and keeping it together and, and not bombarding people and confusing them by a whole lot of different terms and, and programs that are just coming and going in the schools. I think that's really important. Yeah, yeah. There, did, there are several questions that where there's that concern is demonstrated about how to help schools work with children and um, Kids Matter obviously is a standout example of that at the moment. Um, Sally, do you have any observations about that? Um, just really wanted to re-say what Michael said in his slide yeah. about the, something, the nature of childhood is to experience anxiety, that, that to grow up, to separate yeah. from the mother, mm. to go into grade one, all of these developmental changes um, are accompanied by anxiety and that, um, that I think sort of I don't, I'm not very fond of the word normalisation, but something about getting hold of that idea is that, that anxiety isn't something to be stamped out, it's something to be, uh, to be contained and managed and understood. Um, that, that, um, I, I think that's an important sort of frame of mind that, that um, also can reduce something of the stigma. But it, I think that requires a whole cultural shift for, for that to be to happen or else everyone's frightened yeah. of the anxiety which is part of the stigma. Yes, yes. Thank you Sally. Look we haven't got long, about six minutes left. So would each of you just like to make a statement about, you know, to summarise your perspective on what's been discussed this evening. Um, could I ask you first Michael? Your reflections yeah. on what Sorry, your reflections on what we've been discussing, just very briefly. I think they can be summed up by the concluding sentence in, a, uh, in an article of the current Medical Journal of Australia by John Giovannese from Adelaide, who says, we need to give children the gift of being good at feelings, of being able to make sense of uncomfortable but healthy sadness, anger, fear and shame, rather than the gift of feeling good, which is shallow and evaporates in the place of adversity. Excellent. <laughs> and is the Medical Journal of Australia publicly access accessible? Uh, I'm afraid think, by I subscription. Might... Oh, only by subscription. Okay. Oh well. Um, yes. Well, just maybe there are ways people can get hold of that. It's a great quote. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Would you? How would you like to sum up our discussion so far tonight? Uh, I think it's been a really good discussion and I'm really glad to see primary school mental health put on the agenda. Um, I, f I think Kids Matter is growing and I, f I would love to see it in more primary schools I've, as I've seen firsthand on how effective it has been just in one of my schools. Um, I feel like there's still a long way to go in terms of funding and um, putting more money into mental health and education. Um, one initiative I didn't get to talk about was Safe Minds and I think that's something that... Um, Could you say that again I, please? Is what? Safe Minds. Which Safe Minds, uh-huh. Safe Minds, yeah. It's an initiative yep. um, put forward by the Department of Education in Victoria so if the participants wanted to look at that a little bit more online. It's, um, it, it's part of under the umbrella of Kids Matter as well in some part and it does um, enable parents and and teachers to have a look a little bit more about um, approaching mental health around those some of those difficult questions that the participants talked about in terms of how do we talk to parents about 
a little bit of those concerns they might have in the classroom. And a safe mind gives you a really good perspective around that as well. So, um, okay, yeah, I think just knowing what resources are out there and utilising them is really crucial because there's, there's yeah, there and I a think, lot out there. <laughs> I think there are some resources attached to tonight's webinar as well. Um, Sally, would you like to just summarise what your reflections are about our discussion this evening? I want to say here, here to the John Giardini quote. I, I think that's <laughs> wonderful. Um, and and I, I, I sort of sometimes feel that that, that the um, actual sort of descriptions of mental health, our language, often get in the way of of, um, of a collaborative pro. Um, uh, collaborative processes that the, uh, the yes. anxiety about mm. mental, uh, you know, and and what that means, I think, often gets in the way, and that uh, in a in a different sort of culture, we might be calling this problems in living, um, yes. and and um, be able to a approach help for Tom in a in a slightly different different angle and I guess yeah. I just also want to just appreciate all teachers are on some level whether they like it or not mental health workers and something absolutely of, something of the appreciation of that um, being central thanks to Sally the work yeah we, we all do Lynn would you like to conclude with your reflections thanks thanks Vicki um, just ditto to all of the above I guess it's, it's okay coming in last. but I think um, the importance of this work the importance of respecting family, children, um, teachers and, and all the workers and the different perspectives that they bring. So I think that you know that was sort of respectful mm -hmm. approaches to working together is what it strikes for me. Well thank you to our panel members Sarah, Sally and Michael. And um, did I leave someone out? Me, Lynn. Sarah, Sally, Michael and Lynn of course. <laughs> um, and, and the collaboration is certainly incredibly complex and that quote that Sally gave us much earlier this evening kind of you know the sort of almost we want to collaborate we're all on the same page in one way but there are the hidden reefs underneath the waters so that that get in the way and um, maybe sabotage and I mentioned earlier supervision and having support so that um, negotiating collaborative processes is um, made it perhaps a little bit easier or less complex. Um, the importance of talking to one another, working together, keeping communication open, um, using the internet as Sarah described a little while ago um, and not forgetting we are collaborating, collaborating with parents and their children as well. So um, it, it's very worthwhile but it is very time consuming and to develop collaborative practices takes a long time. It's not something one can just do in the snap of the fingers. So that concludes um, the webinar. I just have a couple of things to let you know. That um, think about establishing special interest networks yourself through mental health professional network, and please do complete the exit survey. Um, there are webinars coming up next year. One next year is supporting mental health or victims of family violence in February. So that's one to um, plan for. And thank you all very much for coming along tonight and um, your questions that you submitted and your comments online. So we'll say good evening and thank you very much. <laughs>